In this interactive video, we're moving ahead in time, moving along, and we're looking at the early civilizations and myth. So we look at, um, you know, Paleolithic and Neolithic times. Now we're moving ahead in time to the, like the first civilizations and their mythology. So specifically like 4,000 BCE to 800 BCE. And in terms of our uh, cartoon timeline, we're talking about like right around in here, right? kind of like the Bronze Age. So we've moved through up to about this point. And I thought this would be kind of cool to show everybody just to get an idea of what the world looked like in terms of their cultural and technological stages at the end of the second millennium BCE. Right, so that falls in this time period that we're talking about. So we've got Paleolithic slash Mesolithic hunter-gatherers are, I mean, the, anything in yellow, that's the state of the culture slash the technology at this time in history. And then in purple is the nomadic pastoralists. So those were all centered around here, if you notice. And then there were simple farming societies so these kind of overlap with neolithic right where um agriculture was was the defining characteristic of the move from paleolithic slash mesolithic to uh neolithic so the purple and the green are well the purple like i said were nomadic pastoralists so they were like in between paleolithic and neolithic and then we've got the simple farming societies in the, in the light, in the, in the green, and complex farming societies in orange all formed like right around here, mostly with some little reserves throughout the world otherwise. And then there were state societies emerging right in here if you notice, and then some over here too. So I just thought that was interesting. I love these snapshots of where was the world at throughout history, because you can really see how um, ideas and technologies have a tendency to travel, right? And then in some cases, just like what's interesting is if you just look at this in purple, it seems to all be um, centered here, but then boom, right? I think that stuff's kind of a trip. But we're talking, as, as far as the early civilizations are concerned, the earliest of them, we're looking at the Sumerians, and that's roughly 4,000 BCE, the Assyrians, and that's roughly 3,000 BCE, and then the Babylonians, and that's roughly 1,900. BCE. And you can see that's all makes up what, what is commonly known as ancient Mesopotamia, all located between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers here on the map. And then here is, you know, a more um, modern looking map to show you that area and what it is now. I mean, it's, it's Syria and Iraq. So just talk about a few basic historical characteristics of these early civilizations. Um, again, it's in the Metal Ages, so most specifically the Bronze Age. And bronze technology involves, it's complex, it involves smelting an alloy from copper and some other metal, which is m mostly tin, sometimes it's arsenic, in a furnace. So we can see the technological capabilities and know-how starting to advance during this age. And the Iron Age um, is roughly during this time period here, right? Some people say it ended. Some people say it never ended because it's still one of our primary building materials. So why would you, you know, the Iron Age kind of, you know, never really ended but different historians will classify things in different time periods. So that's just the way that stuff goes. So iron technology involves smelting iron in something called a bloomery. And this is a bloomery, 
and you can see other pictures of you know the smelting process up here with bronze and down here ostensibly with iron and during this period that we're talking about here we see the emergence of quote unquote permanent complex state societies and civilizations around the world this is the first time they're starting to um people are starting to live more permanently in the same place and build infrastructure if you will around them in order to cope with the world and to organize themselves as well so up here is a mesopotamian right we've got the um indus valley in india egyptian um there is mayan uh chinese we've got greek and persian well so sorry greek here chinese here and um aztec incan so all over the world and interestingly we start to see these societies these more permanent complex state societies emerging and bronze age cultures differed in their development of the first writing and according to archaeological evidence cultures in Mesopotamia used cuneiform and Egypt used hieroglyphs and these two two areas developed the earliest practical writing systems and this is this is critical this is where if you think about it um this is where these these more permanent state societies started to for whatever reason because they found a need to do it or the will to do it or the technology to do it started to record ideas and events and instructions even in what we would call writing today so this is um so hieroglyphs and we've got cuneiform and also we've got um irrigation for the first time and soap and the wheel so just imagine the sort of an, um uh, the impact that these technological advances had on humanity as a whole in terms of development and, and simple everyday coping with the world so accordingly we've got city gods and goddesses so as we've discussed previously we've seen um in, during paleolithic times the most likely emergence of sky gods and goddesses and during neolithic times we see the emergence of earth gods and goddesses and then when the city comes to the forefront as the main uh, mechanism or mode of living in the world and coping with the world now you're going to see the emergence of city gods and goddesses so for instance there's like marduk in mesopotamia um mat in egypt there's Ammon in Egypt, there's Vishnu in India, there's Hestia in Greece, and Athena in Greece, and Apollo in Greece, and Cheng Huang Gong in China, and Heimdall in Norse mythology, all very tightly associated with protection of advancement of the city state structure. And then going hand in hand with um, city gods and goddesses and living in the city structure, we start to see the emergence of flood myths right because imagine that all the work you put into a city-state structure 
with buildings and domiciles and agriculture and you begin to um, organize yourselves and uh, write and take and keep things and historicize one of the worst things that could possibly happen to you would be that a flood comes and wipes out all of your progress it wouldn't be like um I mean, this would be devastating to to hunt nomadic hunter gatherers as well but i suppose that they would because they are nomadic just simply move to another area sure that it could cause a lot of trouble for the tribes or the kinship groups but this a flood would be absolutely devastating to people who are living within um an established uh, and a crude city structure. So we start to see these flood myths um, proliferate. So there's, for instance, the Epic of Gilgamesh from Mesopotamia, the myth of Deucalion from Greece, and the Satapatha Brahmana in India, and Noah's Ark from the Mediterranean Basin and the great flood of Gunyu in China, and the Popol Vuh, which is a Mayan flood myth, and the myth of the five suns, that's an Aztec flood myth, or part of it is a, is flood myth, and Nanbazo and the great flood, which is Native American, and um, from the Prose Edda, there's a blood flood, which is um, from Norse mythology. So as far as the myths themselves are concerned and what we will take a look at, um, there are a few myths that exemplify the concerns of both Paleolithic and Neolithic people, which are reflected in the myths written during this time, right? So it's not as if in every time period it just, hey, we're not Paleolithic anymore, so let's not bother, right? That's it. We're not Paleolithic. Now we're Neolithic. That's not the way that people think about themselves, nor was it the way that people thought about themselves. It, history just moved in a continuum. So what we start to see represented during the early civilizations is kind of an accumulation of both Paleolithic and Neolithic and now civilized concerns. And we see this in the Enuma Elish and um, the Epic of Gilgamesh for instance, both of which are from Mesopotamia. Now, let's talk about a few of the takeaways from Karen Armstrong's argument regarding this period in history and its mythologies. So she argues that in this period, human life was becoming more self-aware, more self-conscious, and that now people could give permanent expression to their aspirations in what's called the civilized arts. And the invention of writing meant that they could give enduring literary expression to their mythology. Remember that the invention of writing is what, and I should have emphasized this more in an earlier slide, but I'll do it now. The invention of writing is what typically separates what we call prehistoric from historic times, right? And it's not prehistoric, like in the sense of wearing a, like the Flintstones, if you remember that cartoon or if you've ever seen it, um, you know, with bones and, and in your hair and stuff like that. It's, are you, are you consciously capturing the story? Is a people consciously capturing its own story to save for later generations or um, through writing, or is it not? And obviously, being able to write is a, the prerequisite of being able to do that. So that prehistoric means that it wasn't being done yet. And then now, with the invention of writing, people are recording their experiences and instructions and events and all sorts of things ostensibly to um to uh, preserve for the future but also to just give expression to what they were experiencing so once again 
the invention of writing during this period marks the difference between what is commonly known as the prehistoric versus the historic periods. And like I just said, they entered the historical age. In the cities, the rate of change accelerated and people became more aware of the chain of cause and effect. Um, I guess they were living less in the here and now, and they started to be able to capture things in writing, reflect on them, and then look back into the past through um, via this writing and then project it into the future. Right. So new technologies also gave city dwellers a more complete control over their environment and they were becoming increasingly more distinct from the natural world. Once again, living less in the here and now and within and of the natural world. And they were beginning to kind of separate themselves from the natural world and starting to see the natural world as something that could be manipulated and um, tamed and used and harnessed for their own interests. This is another major part of Karen Strong Armstrong's argument, right? The move away from being kind of like one with nature to being separate from nature, at least thinking they were. As their ancestors had, had um, excuse me, as their ancestors had regarded hunting slash farming as sacred or transformative activities, these early city dwellers saw their cultural attainments as essentially divine. So once again, that's the so the argument goes. That's why we begin to see the emergence of city gods and goddesses and city myths, and so consequently. They couldn't see the gods from the past in the same way as their ancestors had, because human actions were now center stage, as opposed to the sky or the earth being, or the weather being center stage. The gods started to seem more remote to them, and they were no longer a reality that was as self-evident as they were in earlier historical periods. I'm just going to skip this uh, bullet point because I just made my point here. Actually, let me go back um, just to just to um, hit a point that I didn't hit. The rituals were the symbolic acts that accomplished a sort of sacred union between the immediate and the eternal during the uh, Paleolithic and Neolithic ages. And once again, the argument goes, and if you could visualize this, if you could visualize like um, what she's arguing and what many other, other historians and um, religious scholars have argued is that we're kind of moving away, we as humanity, it's kind of moving away from nature and starting to see nature, meaning the natural world around us, as something separate from us, as opposed to us being part of it and it a part of us. It's a moving away. It's a divorce from nature, if you would. So urban life had changed mythology. The gods were beginning to seem remote. The old rituals and stories failed to project men and women into the divine realm, which had at one point seemed so close to them. And people were becoming disillusioned with the old mythical vision that had nourished their ancestors. So as cities became more and more organized and policing became more efficient and Robbers and bandits are brought to justice through the people themselves in these new cities. The gods seemed increasingly careless to them and indifferent to the plight of humanity. So Karen Armstrong's part of another critical part of her argument here is that there was a spiritual vacuum. And in some parts of the civilized world, the old spirituality declined and nothing new appeared to take 
its place. Now, if you will, she is arguing that we start to begin to see humanity as a whole, that the, especially, the you know, specifically, the places that are be becoming, quote unquote, civilized, meaning living in civilization with organization and politics and permanence, um, they're kind of saying, bye-bye gods, we don't need you any longer. We don't need any sort of you, spiritual union with you any longer. You don't hold as much, if any, sway over us any longer. This is part of the argument. So, and, and critically also is that that starts to go away, but nothing new in the quote unquote spiritual realm arises to take its place. It, certainly organization and technology and writing and government, etc. you could say is taking its place, but that's all practical, mundane, worldly stuff, correct? Spiritually, there's just a vacuum, a hole. There's nothing there. And eventually, this malaise, right, with this vacuum and what sort of depression, she's arguing, this emptiness that is left from this spiritual vacuum, eventually this malaise led to yet another great transformation historically, which is known by many um, historians and religious um, scholars as the axial age. And this is the period of history that we will take on next after we examine some of the myths from this period, which is the early civilizations. We'll move on to the axial age. Okay, so topics covered um, in this interactive video and um, a look at what myths we'll study in the next module, right? We looked at the basic characteristics of the ancient civilizations and the Bronze Age and the emergence of writing and the emergence of the historical period. And we looked at some of the takeaways from Karen Armstrong's argument. And then just so that you know, in the next module, we will read a portion of um, the Enuma Elish and the Epic of Gilgamesh, which are Mesopotamian.